The Ghana Empire c. 700 until c. 1240, properly known as Akar Ghana or Ghana being the title of its ruler, was located in the area of present-day southeastern Mauritania and western Mali. Complex societies based on trans-Saharan trade with salt and gold had existed in the region since ancient times, but the introduction of the camel to the Western Sahara in the 3rd century AD opened the way to great changes in the area that became the Ghana Empire. By the time of the Muslim conquest of North Africa in the 7th century the camel had changed the ancient, more irregular trade routes into a trade network running from Morocco to the Niger River. The Ghana Empire grew rich from this increased trans-Saharan trade in gold and salt, allowing for larger urban centers to develop. The traffic furthermore encouraged territorial expansion to gain control over the different trade routes. When Ghana's ruling dynasty began remains uncertain, it is mentioned for the first time in written records by Muhammad ibn Musa al-Khwarizmi in 830. In the 11th century the Cordoban scholar Abu Af traveled to the region and gave a detailed description of the kingdom. He claimed that the Ghana could put 200,000 men into the field, more than 40,000 of them archers, and noted they had cavalry forces as well. As the empire declined, it finally became a vassal of the rising Mali Empire at some point in the 13th century. When the Gold Coast in 1957 became the first country in sub Saharan Africa to regain its independence from colonial rule, it renamed itself in honor of the Long Gone Empire. Origin Topic. Theories of foreign state founders The origins of Ghana have been dominated by fights between ethno-historic accounts and archaeological interpretations. The earliest discussions of its origins are found in the Sudanese chronicles of Mahmud Qadi and Abd al-Rahman as Sadi. According to Qadi's Tariq al fetash in a section probably composed by the author around 1580, but citing the authority of the chief judge of Masina, Ida al Masini, who lived somewhat earlier, twenty kings ruled Ghana before the advent of the Prophet, and the empire extended until the century after the Prophet. In addressing the ruler's origin, the Tariq al fetash provides three different opinions one that they were Saniki, another that they were Wangara, which are a Saniki group, and another that they were Sanhaya Berbers. Al Qadi favored another interpretation in view of the fact that their genealogies linked them to this group, adding, What is certain is that they were not Saniki, Min al Sawadin. While the 16th century versions of genealogies might have linked Ghana to the Sanhaya, earlier versions, for example, as reported by the 11th century writer al Adrisi and the 13th century writer Ibn Said, noted that rulers of Ghana in those days traced their descent from the clan of the Prophet Muhammad either through his protector Abi Talib, or through his son in law Ali. He says that 22 kings ruled before the Hijra and 22 after. While these early views lead to many exotic interpretations of a foreign origin of Wagadu, these views are generally disregarded by scholars. Levsion and Spalding for example, argue that al Adrisi's testimony should be looked at very critically due to demonstrably gross miscalculations in geography and historical chronology, while they themselves associate Ghana with the local Saniki. In addition, the archaeologist and historian Raymond Mani argues that al Qadis and al Sadis' view of a foreign origin cannot be regarded as reliable. He argues that the interpretations were based on the later presence after Ghana's demise of nomadic interlopers on the assumption that they were the historic ruling caste, and that the writers did not adequately consider contemporary accounts such as those of al Yakubi AD, al Masudi, c. 944 AD, Ibn Haqqal. 977 AD, al Biruni, c. 1036 AD, as well as al Bakri, all of whom describe the population and rulers of Ghana as Negroes. Topic: <laughs> History of Islam in the Ghana Empire. Modern scholars, particularly African Muslim scholars, have argued about the extension of the Ghana Empire and tenure of its reign. Islamic religion was known very well around the Asian African European area. The African Arabist, Abu Abdullah Adilabu, has claimed that some non Muslim historians played down the territorial expansion of the Ghana Empire in what he called an attempt to undermine the influence of Islam in Old Ghana. In his work The Ghana World, A Pride for the Continent, Adilabu maintained that works of such Muslim historians and geographers in Europe as the Cordoban scholar Abu Ubaid al-Bakri had been subjugated to accommodate contrary views of non-Muslim Europeans. 
Adilabu claimed constant cold shouldering of Ibn Yasin's geography of school of Imam Malik in which he gave a comprehensive account of social and religious activities in the Ghana Empire have well attested compositional bias of Ghana history documentation, especially by the European historians on topics related to Islam and the ancient Muslim societies. Adilabu said, the early Muslim documentaries including Ibn Yasin's revelations on ancient African major centers of Muslim culture crossing the Maghreb and the Sahel to Timbuktu and downward to Ashanti regions had not just presented researchers in the field of African history with solutions to the scarcity of written sources in large parts of sub-Saharan Africa, it consolidated confidence in techniques of oral history, historical linguistics and archaeology for authentic Islamic traditions in Africa. Topic. Oral traditions In the late 19th century, as French forces occupied the region in which ancient Ghana lay, colonial officials began collecting traditional accounts, including some manuscripts written in Arabic somewhat earlier in the century. Several such traditions were recorded and published. While there are variants, these traditions called the most ancient polity they knew of Wagadu, or the place of the Wago, the term current in the 19th century for the local nobility. The traditions described the kingdom as having been founded by a man named Dinga, who came from the east, e.g., Aswan, Egypt, after which he migrated to a variety of locations in the western Sudan, in each place leaving children by different wives. In order to achieve power in his final location he had to kill a goblin, and then marry his daughters, who became the ancestors of the clans that were dominant in the region at the time of the recording of the tradition. Upon Dinga's death, his two sons Kine and Diabe contested the kingship, and Diabe was victorious, founding the kingdom, an old but increasingly explored view as the Akan people to the founding of the pre-Islamic Ghana Empire. Oral traditions of the ruling Abraid Aduana clan relate that they originated from ancient Ghana. They migrated from the north, they went through Egypt and settled in Nubia Sudan. Around 500 AD 5th century, due to the pressure exerted on Nubia by the Aksumite kingdom of Ethiopia, Nubia was shattered, and the Akan people moved west and established small trading kingdoms. These kingdoms grew, and around 750 AD the Empire of Ghana was formed. The empire lasted from 750 AD to 1200 AD and collapsed as a result of the introduction of Islam in the western Sudan, and the zeal of the Muslims to impose their religion. Their ancestors eventually left for Kong i.e. present-day Ivory Coast. From Kong they moved to Wam and then to Dorma, both located in present-day Brong Ahafo region. The movement from Kong was necessitated by the desire of the people to find suitable savanna conditions since they were not used to forest life. What adds credence to the oral narrative is that the ruling caste kings of ancient Ghana was described by Arab historian al-Bakri as matrilineal in succession a system in all of Africa preserved and honored exactly the same among Akan people. Al-Bakri was fascinated by the matrilineal tradition of succession where he stated, The kingdom is inherited only by the son of the king's sister. Tunkamanan, the king during the time of al-Bakri, was the nephew of the previous king, King Basi. Al-Bakri, coming from a patrilineal culture, explains, "...the king has no doubt that his successor is the son of his sister, while he is not certain that his son is in fact his own, and he does not rely on the genuineness of this relationship." The matrilineal succession of ancient Ghana is paralleled exactly within the kingship, chieftaincy traditions, which still determine succession among Akans of the modern Republic of Ghana and Ivory Coast. In addition, al-Bakri's account of the splendor of the royal court of Ghana, its etiquette and ritual observance is virtually indistinguishable from Thomas Edward Bowditch's descriptions of the splendors of the empire of Ashanti court in 1817. Both describe pages or messengers with shields and breastplates decorated with gold and the awesome sounds of massed drummers and horns of gold. The king of ancient Ghana was described as able to deploy 200,000 men warriors in the field just like the king of Ashanti. Although modern historians whom are often driven and or influenced by Western and or Islamic religious bias ignore the authenticity of the Akan ancestral long march from ancient North Africa's Egypt Sudan, and the Western Sudan's pre-Islamicized empire of Ghana, the parallels in cultural identity indicate a historical legacy, which is more than just chance coincidence. 
Theories concerning the foundation of Ghana French colonial officials, notably Maurice Delafosse, concluded that Ghana had been founded by the Berbers, a nomadic group originating from the Benue River, from Middle Africa, and linked them to North African and Middle Eastern origins. While Delafosse produced a convoluted theory of an invasion by Judeo Syrians, which he linked to the Fulb, others took the tradition at face value and simply accepted that nomads had ruled first. Raymond Mani, synthesizing early archaeology, various traditions, and the Arabic materials in 1961 concluded that foreign trade was vital to the empire's foundation. More recent work, for example by Nehemiah Levsion, in his classic work published in 1973, sought to harmonize archaeology, descriptive geographical sources written between 830 and 1400, the older traditions of the Tariqs, from the 16th and 17th centuries and finally the traditions collected by French administrators. Levsion concluded that local developments, stimulated by trade from North Africa were crucial in the development of the state, and tended to favor the more recently collected traditions over the other traditions in compiling his work. While there has not been much further study of either traditions or documents, archaeologists have added considerable nuance to the ultimate play of forces. <laughs> Contribution of archaeological research Archaeological research was slow to enter the picture. While French archaeologists believed they had located the capital, Kumbi Sala in the 1920s, when they located extensive stone ruins in the general area given in most sources for the capital, and others argued that elaborate burials in the Niger Bend area may have been linked to the empire, it was not until 1969, when Patrick Munson excavated at Dar Tichet in modern-day Mauritania that the probability of an entirely local origin was raised. The Dar Tichet site had clearly become a complex culture by 1600 BCE and had architectural and material culture elements that seemed to match the site at Kumbi Sala. In more recent work in Dar Tichet, and then in Dar Nima and Dar Walada, it has become more and more clear that as the desert advanced, the Dar Tichet culture, which had abandoned its earliest site around 300 BC, possibly because of pressure from desert nomads, but also because of increasing aridity, and moved southward into the still well watered areas of northern Mali. This now seems the likely history of the complex society that can be documented at Kumbi Sala. Kumbi Sala The empire's capital is believed to have been at Kumbi Sala on the rim of the Sahara Desert. According to the description of the town left by al Bakri in 1067-1068, the capital was actually two cities 10 kilometres apart but, "...between these two towns are continuous habitations," so that they might be said to have merged into one. Muslim district The name of the other section of the city is not recorded. It was surrounded by wells with fresh water, where vegetables were grown. It was inhabited almost entirely by Muslims along with twelve mosques, one of which was designated for Friday prayers, and had a full group of scholars, scribes and Islamic jurists. Because the majority of these Muslims were merchants, this part of the city was probably its primary business district. It is likely that these inhabitants were largely black Muslims known as the Wangara and are today known as Dayula and Jakanka. The separate and autonomous Rand towns outside of the main government is a well-known practice used by the Dayula and Jakanka Muslims throughout history. <laughs> Archaeology A 17th-century chronicle written in Timbuktu, the Tariq al-Fatash, gives the name of the capital as Kumbi. Beginning in the 1920s, French archaeologists began excavating the site of Kumbi Sala, although there have always been controversies about the location of Ghana's capital and whether Kumbi Sala is the same town as the one described by al Bakri. The site was excavated in 1949 50 by Tomasi and Mani and by another French team in 1975 81. However, the remains of Kumbi Sala are impressive, even if the remains of the royal town, with its large palace and burial mounds has not been located. Another problem for archaeology is that Al-Adrisi, a 12th-century writer, described Ghana's royal city as lying on a riverbank, a river he called the Nile, following the geographic custom of his day of confusing the Niger and Senegal, which do not meet, as forming a single river often called the 
Nile of the Blacks. Whether Al-Adrisi was referring to a new and later capital located elsewhere, or whether there was confusion or corruption in his text is unclear, however he does state that the royal palace he knew of was built in 510 AH AD, suggesting that it was a newer town, rebuilt closer to the Niger than Kumbi Sala. Economy <inaudible> 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 Most of our information about the economy of Ghana comes from Al Bakri. Al Bakri noted that merchants had to pay a one gold dinar tax on imports of salt, and two on exports of salt. Other products paid fixed dues. Al Bakri mentioned both copper and other goods. Imports probably included products such as textiles, ornaments, and other materials. Many of the hand crafted leather goods found in old Morocco also had their origins in the empire. The main center of trade was Kumbi Sala. The king claimed as his own all nuggets of gold, and allowed other people to have only gold dust. In addition to the exerted influence of the king onto local regions, tribute was also received from various tributary states and chiefdoms to the empire's periphery. The introduction of the camel played a key role in Saniki's success as well, allowing products and goods to be transported much more efficiently across the Sahara. These contributing factors all helped the empire remain powerful for some time, providing a rich and stable economy that was to last over several centuries. The empire was also known to be a major education hub. Once originally named Wagadu, the Kingdom of Ghana was located in present-day Mauritania and western Mali. The Kingdom of Ghana was a very wealthy kingdom for numerous reasons, one of the reasons being the trans-Saharan trade. The Kingdom of Ghana was very populated and had many people from outside the kingdom travel through in order to trade with those from the Kingdom of Ghana or to trade with other outsiders, making Ghana a focal point trading center. Some of the most important parts of products that were trade within Ghana were salt and gold. With gold and salt being transported and traded through Ghana, the Kingdom of Ghana was able to become very wealthy by taxing the goods that came through the trade center. Other materials that were popular within trading in Ghana were ivory, slaves, horses, swords, spices, silks, and even books from Europeans. Because Ghana had a large military force, they would charge people for protection if they so desired it when trading to protect themselves and their goods. The fact that Ghana had many trade routes that were well protected also encouraged other merchants to come to Ghana and trade. With the amount of protection on the trade routes and the large number of trade routes, Ghana was given the nickname the Gold Coast. Because so many people trade through Ghana, Ghana was essentially a melting pot, spreading ideas, culture, technology and other aspects of what makes different societies what they were. Eventually the Kingdom of Ghana came to its downfall, a decline in power. Ghana was attacked by other regions who were in need of the resources that Ghana possessed. The Kingdom of Ghana eventually merged with Mali, which became one of the largest empires in African history and one of the richest as well. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Government. Much testimony on ancient Ghana depended on how well disposed the king was to foreign travelers, from which the majority of information on the empire comes. Islamic writers often commented on the social-political stability of the empire based on the seemingly just actions and grandeur of the king. A Moorish nobleman living in Spain by the name of al-Bakri questioned merchants who visited the empire in the 11th century and wrote of the king, He sits in audience or to hear grievances against officials in a domed pavilion around which stand ten horses covered with gold-embroidered materials. Behind the king stand ten pages holding shields and swords decorated with gold, and on his right are the sons of the kings of his country wearing splendid garments and their hair plated with gold. The governor of the city sits on the ground before the king and around him are ministers seated likewise. At the door of the pavilion are dogs of excellent pedigree that hardly ever leave the place where the king is, guarding him. Around their necks they wear collars of gold and silver studded with a number of balls of the same metals. Ghana appears to have had a central core region and was surrounded by vassal states. One of the earliest sources to describe Ghana, al Yakubi, writing in 889 90 A, says that, Under his authority are a number of kings, which included Sama and Am, and so extended at least to the Niger Valley. These kings were presumably the rulers of the territorial units often called Kafu in Mandinka. 
The Arabic sources, the only ones to give us any information, are sufficiently vague as to how the country was governed, that we can say very little. al bakri far and away the most detailed one, does mention that the king had officials mazalim, who surrounded his throne when he gave justice, and these included the sons of the kings of his country, which we must assume are the same kings that al yaqubi mentioned in his account of nearly 200 years earlier. Al-Bakri's detailed geography of the region shows that in his day, or 1067–1068, Ghana was surrounded by independent kingdoms, and Sila, one of them located on the Senegal River, was "...almost a match for the king of Ghana." Sama is the only such entity mentioned as a province, as it was in al yaqubis day. In al bakris time, the rulers of Ghana had begun to incorporate more Muslims into government, including the treasurer, his interpreter and "...the majority of his officials." Topic. Decline Given the scattered nature of the Arabic sources and the ambiguity of the existing archaeological record, it is difficult to determine when and how Ghana declined and fell. The earliest descriptions of the empire are vague as to its maximum extent, though according to al bakri Ghana had forced Adagost in the desert to accept its rule sometime between 970 and 1054. By al bakris own time, however, it was surrounded by powerful kingdoms, such as Sila. Ghana was combined in the Kingdom of Mali in 1240 marking the end of the Ghana Empire. A tradition in historiography maintains that Ghana fell when it was sacked by the Almoravid movement in 1076–77, although Ghanaians resisted attack for a decade, but this interpretation has been questioned. Conrad and Fisher argued that the notion of any Almoravid military conquest at its core is merely perpetuated folklore, derived from a misinterpretation or naive reliance on Arabic sources. Dirk Lang agrees but argues that this does not preclude Almoravid political agitation, claiming that Ghana's demise owed much to the latter. Cheryl L. Burkhalter was skeptical of Conrad and Fisher's arguments and suggested that there was reasons to believe that there was conflict between the Almoravids and the Empire of Ghana. Furthermore, the archaeology of ancient Ghana simply does not show the signs of rapid change and destruction that would be associated with any Almoravid era military conquests. While there is no clear cut account of a sack of Ghana in the contemporary sources, the country certainly did convert to Islam. For Al Adrisi, whose account was written in 1154, has the country fully Muslim by that date. Ibn Khaldun, a 14th-century North African historian who read and cited both al bakri and al adrisi does report an ambiguous account of the country's history as related to him by Uthman, a faqih of Ghana who took a pilgrimage to Mecca in 1394, that the power of Ghana waned as that of the veiled people grew, through the Almoravid movement. Al Adrisi's report does not give any reason in particular to cause us to believe that the empire was any smaller or weaker than it had been in the days of al Bakri, 75 years earlier, and in fact he describes its capital as, "...the greatest of all towns of the Sudan with respect to area, the most populous, and with the most extensive trade." It is clear, however, that Ghana was incorporated into the Mali Empire, according to a detailed account of al-Umari, written around 1340, but based on testimony given to him by the "...truthful and trustworthy Sheikh Abu Uthman Said al-Dukali, a long-term resident." In al-Umari, al-Dukali's version, Ghana still retained its functions as a sort of kingdom within the empire, its ruler being the only one allowed to bear the title Malik and who is like a deputy unto him. Aftermath and so-so occupation According to Ibn Khaldun, following Ghana's conversion, "...the authority of the rulers of Ghana dwindled away and they were overcome by the so-so who subjugated and subdued them." Some modern traditions identify the Susu as the so-so, inhabitants of Kaniaga. According to much later traditions, from the late 19th and 20th centuries, Diara Conte took control of Kumbi Sala and established the Diariso dynasty. His son, Samauro Conte, succeeded him and forced the people to pay him tribute. The Soso also managed to annex the neighboring Mandinka state of Kangaba to the south, where the important goldfields of Burr were located. <laughs> Malinke rule In his brief overview of Sudanese history, Ibn Khaldun related that, 
The people of Mali outnumbered the peoples of the Sudan in their neighborhood and dominated the whole region. He went on to relate that they vanquished the Susu and acquired all their possessions, both their ancient kingdom and that of Ghana. According to a modern tradition, this resurgence of Mali was led by Sundiata Keita, the founder of Mali and ruler of its core area of Kangaba. Delafos assigned an arbitrary but widely accepted date of 1230 to the event. This tradition states that Ghana Sumaba Sise, at the time a vassal of the Soso, rebelled with Kangaba and became part of a loose federation of Mande speaking states. After Someoro's defeat at the Battle of Karina in 1235, a date again assigned arbitrarily by Delafos, the new rulers of Kumbi Sala became permanent allies of the Mali Empire. As Mali became more powerful, Kumbi Sala's role as an ally declined to that of a submissive state, and it became the client described in Al Umari, Al Dukali's account of 1340. Etymology <inaudible> 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 The word Ghana means warriors, and was the title given to the rulers of the original kingdom whose Saniki name was Wagadu. Kaya Magan Lord of the Gold was another title for these kings. The extraordinary renown of the Ghana Empire induced Kwame Nkrumah, the political leader of the Gold Coast, to name his country Ghana when it attained independence in 1957. Topic rulers Topic Saniki rulers Ghanas of the Sise dynasty King Kaya Maga or Kaya Megan, circa 700 AD Mayan Diabe Sise, circa 790s Basi, 1040-1062 Tunka Manan, 1062-1076 Almoravid occupation Abu Bakr ibn Umar, 1076-1087 Soso rulers Kambine Diareso, 1087-1090 Suleiman, 1090-1100 Banu Babu, 1100-1100 1120 Majin Wagadu, 1120-1130 Gain, 1130-1140 Musa, 1140-1160 Barama, 1160-1180 Topic Rulers during Kaniaga occupation Diara Conte, 1180-1202 Sumaba Sise as vassal of Samauro, 1203-1235 Topic Ghanas of Wagadu tributary Sumaba Sise as ally of Sunjata Keita, 1235-1240 Topic See also History of the Saniki people Islam in Africa topic Notes topic References Berthier, Sophie 1997, Recherches archéologiques sur la capitale de l'Empire de Ghana, étude d'une secteur, de habitat à Kumbi Sala, Mauritanie, Campaigns EIIIVV 1975-1976 1980-1981, British Archaeological Reports 680, Cambridge Monographs in African Archaeology 41, Oxford, Archaeopress, ISBN 978-0 0-86054-868-3. Delafosse, Maurice 1912, Hot Senegal Niger, Le Pays, Les Pupils, Les Longs, La Histoire, Les Civilizations, Three Vols in French, Paris, Émile Larossi. Gallica, Vol. 1, Le Pays, Les Pupils, Les Longs, Vol. 2, La Histoire, Vol. 3, Les Civilizations. Hodas, Octave, Delafosse, Maurice, eds. 1913, Tariq el Fetach par Mahmoud Kati et l'une de ses petites fils, two vols, Paris, Ernest Leroux. Volume 1 is the Arabic text, Volume 2 is a translation into French. Reprinted by Maisonneuve in 1964 and 1981. The French text is also available from Aluka but requires a subscription. Hunwick, John O. 2003, Timbuktu and the Songhe Empire, al sadis Tariq al-Sudan down to 1613 and other contemporary documents, Leiden, Brill, ISBN 978-90-04-12560-5. Reprint of the 1999 edition with corrections. In Saul, Timothy 2003, Archaeology of Islam in Sub-Saharan Africa, Cambridge, Cambridge University Press, ISBN 978-0-521-65702-0. Lang, Dirk The Almoravid Expansion and the Downfall of Ghana, Der Islam, 73 2, 313-51, doi, 10.1515, ISLM.1996, 73.2.313. Reprinted in Lang 2004, pp. 455-493. Lang, Dier, 2004, Ancient Kingdoms of West Africa, Dettelbach, Germany, J. H. Roll, ISBN 978-3-89754-115-3.
Levcion, Nehemia 1973, Ancient Ghana and Mali, London, Methuen, ISBN 978-0-8419-0431-6. Reprinted with editions 1980. Levcion, Nehemia, Hopkins, John F. Peds, and Trans. 2000, Corpus of Early Arabic Sources for West Africa, New York, New York, Marcus Wiener, ISBN 978 1 55876 241 1. First published in 1981 by Cambridge University Press, ISBN 0 521 22422 5. Levcion, Nehemia, Spalding, J. 2003, Medieval West Africa, Views from Arab Scholars and Merchants, Princeton N.J., Marcus Wiener, ISBN 978-1-55876-305-0. Excerpts from Levcion and Hopkins 1981. Includes an extended introduction. Masonin, Pekka, Fisher, Humphrey J. 1996, Not Quite Venus from the Waves, The Almoravid Conquest of Ghana in the Modern Historiography of Western Africa PDF, History in Africa, 23-197-232, doi, 10.2307, JSTOR 3171941, asterisk Mani, Raymond A. 1954, the Question of Ghana, Journal of the International African Institute, 24 200–213, JSTOR 1156424. Mani, Raymond Tableau géographique de l'Ouest africain au Moyen Age, de praise les sources écrites, la tradition et l'archéologie, Dakar, Institut français d'Afrique Nord. Munson, Patrick J. Archaeology and the Prehistoric Origins of the Ghana Empire, The Journal of African History, 21 4, 457–466, JSTOR 182004. Tomasi, Paul, Mani, Raymond Compagne de Fools à Kumbi Sala, Bulletin de l'Institut Français de Afrique Nord B in French, 13-438-462, archived from the original on 26 July 2011. Includes a plan of the site. Topic further reading Conrad, David C., Fisher, Humphrey J. The Conquest That Never Was, Ghana and the Almoravids, 1076. I. The External Arabic Sources, History in Africa, 921-59, JSTOR 3171598. Conrad, David C., Fisher, Humphrey J. The Conquest That Never Was, Ghana and the Almoravids, 1076. 2. The Local Oral Sources, History in Africa, 1053-78, JSTOR 3171690. Kornevin, Robert 1965, Ghana, Encyclopedia of Islam Vol. 2 2nd ed., Leiden, Brill, pp. 1001-2, ISBN 978-90-04-07026-4. Cuoq, Joseph M., Translator and Editor 1975, Recule des Sources Arabes Concernant l'Afrique Occidental du Voxvie Siècle Balad al-Sudan in French, Paris, Editions du Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique X1 maint, Extra Text, Authors List link. Reprinted in 1985 with corrections and additional texts, ISBN 2-222-01718-1. Similar to Levcion and Hopkins, 1981 and 2000. Masonin, Pekka 2000, The Negroland Revisited, Discovery and Invention of the Sudanese Middle Ages, Helsinki, Finnish Academy of Science and Letters, pp. 519-23, ISBN 978-951-41-0886-0. Mani, Raymond 1971, The Western Sudan, in Shini, pl. The African Iron Age, Oxford, Oxford University Press, pp. 66–87, ISBN 978-0-19-813158-8. Montile, Charles 1954, La légende du Ouagadou et l'origine des Saniki, Melanges ethnologiques, Dakar, Memoir de l'Institut français d'Afrique Nord 23, pp. 359–408. External links African Kingdoms, Ghana Empires of West Sudan 
Kingdom of Ghana, primary source documents Ancient Ghana — BBC World Service <laughs>